It gives me great pleasure to introduce the speaker for today, uh, Dr. V. Anantanageshwaran, uh, who is the current Chief Economic Advisor. He has a diverse background as a writer, author, teacher and consultant. Um, he has authored several books such as Can India Grow, Derivatives, The Rise of Finance, Causes, Consequences and Cures. He has taught at various business schools and institutes and was in fact one of the founders of uh, Avishkar Venture Capital uh, Fund and the Takshashila Institution. Uh, he has had a long corporate uh, career and serves as an independent director on several boards. He holds a postgraduate diploma in management from IIM Ahmedabad and a doctoral degree from University of Massachusetts. Uh, he's someone we're all so keen to hear about. He's, he's been a writer, for, we've read his work for so long and now he's going to talk on a topic that's very dear to all of us. As, as India, is, everyone talks of India's growth story being inevitable, how do we make that not just inevitable, but also sustainable, balanced and equitable? Without further ado, Dr. Anand Nageshwaran. Good afternoon, everybody. And my sincere thanks to the Asim Premji University and the Bangalore International Center for hosting me. This talk should have taken place a couple of months ago. But due to certain other developments or political calendar in the, in the city, I couldn't make it, but I'm glad that uh, we were able to find another suitable time to do this uh, conversation with you. So the topic is that while there is clearly a momentum in the Indian economy today in terms of economic growth rates, there are some question marks in people's minds, partly justified and partly not as to whether that growth is sustainable, balanced, and equitable. I'm using the word sustainable not in the sense of the environmental language or taxonomy, but in a sense of sustaining something over time. So, so sorry about the, all these uh, graphics that my team has come up with. So this is the title of the talk. And uh, first, we will just give you a general sense of what this talk is going to cover. Initially, briefly about the growth story, the macro big picture, and then the social aspects and the various initiatives that the government has uh, undertaken over the years, and some thoughts on the inequality debate in the country, and then what are the various goals we are pursuing on sustainable development, etc. And I will also, time permitting, talk about the challenges to growth itself in the coming years, whether it is near term or the next few years or even longer. Okay. In general, I think 2021 was the year of pandemic, both the first quarter of uh, the financial year 2021 and the first quarter of the financial year 21-22 were both uh, affected by the pandemic and its impact on both consumption, investment and various parameters of the economy. So we recorded negative GDP growth in both those quarters. However, I think Clearly, two years after the uh, pandemic, the focus has shifted from recovery from the pandemic towards economic recapturing the heights of economic growth, if not the heights that we experienced back in 2003 to 2008, because the global factors were very different at that point. But this time, such global friendly and conducive factors may not be present. But still, from a domestic drivers of growth, there are plenty of reasons to be positive about how growth will play out in the remainder of the decade. And one of the main reasons, not the only reason, one of the reasons that is going to set this decade apart from the previous one is the fact that banking, non-banking and corporate sector balance sheets are much healthier going into the, coming into this third decade compared to what they were coming into the second decade. I'll start with this number. So if you look at the data on Indian domestic bank credit to the entire non-financial sector, which includes the government. So they, it was sort of uh, hovering around 28% of GDP for the better part of the last two decades of the millennium, previous millennium. And then it's, it doubled. This is a ratio that doubled, okay? So we had in the second decade, nominal GDP growth averaging 10 to 12% or even slightly higher in some years. So on top of that, you have had 
bank credit growth rising. That is why the ratio doubled from 28% to 56, 58% of GDP. Naturally, lots of bad loans could be made, partly due to other reasons and partly due to optimism about sustaining those growth rates, which led to a pretty strong expansion of bank credit, topped up by global capital inflows into India, etc. So it, is, it was inevitable, therefore, that this growth in bank credit wasn't sustainable and had to be therefore digested. And the second decade of the millennium, which is when it went flat, was all about digesting the growth in bank credit. Even though you might say from an aggregate absolute perspective, bank credit to GDP ratio in India is on the lower side compared to many other countries. That is true. But just because the, the absolute number is low doesn't mean that one can catch up with that in a very short period without encountering consequences, which is what we did in the second decade. And history tells us when we start looking for explanations as to why GDP growth of India disappointed somewhat in the second decade of the millennium, people tend to attribute it to factors such as one of factors such as demonetization, introduction of the goods and services tax, the Real Estate Regulation Act, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, etc. They might be some of them could have had transient influences and impacts. There's no doubt about that. But when you have a credit boom, which then gives way to a credit bust, which is what we call the financial cycle, we may not have had a financial crisis per se, but it was pretty close. When the banking system encountered double digit uh, uh, non-performing assets, the non-financial banking corporation, ILFS, which was too big to fail, failed in 2018, and corporate sector had to deleverage. It was sort of a mini max financial crisis. And empirical evidence across the world tells us when there is a financial crisis, the, short, the, the drop from the peak of growth rate is pretty sharp. And then it stays low for quite some time. And then the recovery from the financial crisis into normal levels is quite quite slow and also the inflation rate may stay low and then the credit to GDP ratio takes time to pick up. India actually witnessed some combination of all of this. So it, what I'm trying to say here is that when we are trying to explain the relatively mediocre or underperformance of the Indian economy in the second decade compared to the first, one doesn't have to search for explanations that fit with one's priors. There is experience, there is empirical evidence that financial exuberance or financial excess credit growth followed by a credit bust results in such a growth performance is documented across the world. And that is what we experience. That is a more straightforward explanation than idiosyncratic explanation that we keep looking for. And you can see that also in samples with normal recession, financial recession induced by financial cycles, but with banks having a high capital ratio, but a financial recession with low capital ratios, you can see the years it takes for recovery to happen. And similarly, where there are no, with controls, it's even, it's even more so with the credit rationing and other controls. So basically, this is the empirical evidence that played out in India as well. And you can see here, first 2005 to 12, the credit boom that led to balance sheet stress later, phase of higher NPA due to past forbearance. Then you had the ILFS collapse. Then we had the pandemic. And then we had the commodity price shock of 2022 and supply chain disruptions. So as soon as the balance sheet repair got completed by 2020 or so, unfortunately, we could not start enjoying the fruits of it because you had once in a century shock of the pandemic and then the commodity price shock as well. And that is why I think with all these one-off shocks slowly fading away, we can now look forward to a better growth performance in the remainder of the decade. I would be very nervous today if we have the kind of credit to GDP ratio and the bank credit growth or corporate balance sheets that we had in 2012-13. 
the fact that we don't have them now and we are in the beginning stage of a new credit cycle is what makes me relatively more optimistic about the growth prospects in the rest of the decade i kind of draw the parallel although there will always be history may rhyme but never never really repeats there is a certain parallel to what we experienced between 1998 and 2002 and i covered this quite extensively in chapter 2 of the economic survey which was released on january 31st earlier this year between 1998 and 2002 you had a uh, sanctions in fact there was a credit uh, bust non performing assets were rising and dr rangarajan had raised interest rates quite high and in fact that high interest rates is what led both banks and corporates to clean up their act at that time as well so you had a uh, nuclear test and sanctions that followed it banking and corporate sector deleveraging balance sheet repair then as now and then two successive droughts technology bust us recession 911 everything happened somewhat equivalent to the pandemic the war in ukraine you can think of all of those things supply chain disruptions so similarly uh, on the bottom half as well and then uh, during this period of 98 2002 a lot of structural reforms were happening on the side but they were overshadowed by these one off shocks interest rate deregulation actual privatization asset recovery for banks uh, kind of a precursor to the insolvency framework and then the beginning of the attention that the governments in india subsequently paid to physical infrastructure beginning with the golden quadrilateral fiscal responsibility budget management act and telecom sector liberalization which then paved the way for the it sector boom as well so all those things were happening but none of them showed up in gdp numbers between 98 and 2002 because the shocks were very powerful one off and they were impacting the long run effects of these good good decisions and good policy moves that are being made and subsequently when global conditions changed and all these impact of these shocks disappeared a lot of things came together and india had 5 years of gdp growth of 8 to 9% in real terms so if we sort of now come to the current situation 2014 onwards which is about balance sheet repair and then you had many structural reforms that were happening during this period the aadhar program introduction of the single indirect tax insolvency and bankruptcy code some privatization rationalization of tax rates especially on the corporate tax side somewhat less so on the personal income tax side ease of doing business reforms including decriminalization and the production linked incentive schemes atmanirbhar bharat which exemplifies that and the digital public infrastructure which you are more familiar with than i am so if you take these two together the structural reforms happened but financial sector problems overshadowed it on top of that you had one off shocks pandemic global commodity price tightening of financial conditions and therefore now can we look ahead to something similar between 2003 to 2008 my answer is yes a very qualified yes what is the qualification the qualification is that the export sector growth isn't going to be as big a growth booster as it was between 2003 and 8 because the global economy in my opinion isn't in the same rude health as it was and more so in china and other emerging markets which was the differentiating factor between 2003 and 8 and if anything that is the reason why i still keep my growth expectations for india of real gdp of somewhere between 6 and 7% and to be sort of uh, because humans love single specific numbers point targets as if forecasts of economists are ever going to meet those numbers so i would say 6.5% on average in real terms for the remainder of the decade it will be my assessment of what the indian economy can achieve based on what we have done so far and based on the effects of some of the actions taken already in the pipeline if on top of that we are going to address some of the long standing issues at the state government level local government level plus in issues that we all are familiar with on education skilling and more importantly on the so called energy transition then of course uh, we may be able to raise this potential growth level of 6.5% to 7 7.5 but i'm not going to count on that so being a relatively conservative forecaster 
I'm happy to say 6.5% is something that I can say with a reasonable degree of confidence as the average expectations of real GDP growth in the rest of the decade. And it so happens that that is the forecast that the central bank RBI and us have zeroed in on for the current financial year. And it is very seldom that, uh, that the central bank and the North Bloc find themselves in agreement on the growth projections that we seem to have right now, 6.5% on top of the 9.1 and 7.2. But by the way, some of you may be aware that India does publish six estimates of GDP numbers. Okay, The sixth estimate which is frozen three years later is the final one. So the number for year ending March 2023 will be frozen in January 2026. And by the time it comes around, I have a feeling that 7.2 may actually be revised higher. Because the momentum in the economy was pretty good going into the uh, end of uh, FI22, FI23, sorry. And FI24, 6.5% uh, is what we expect. And so far what we have seen in the first four months of the year, do not give us any reason to doubt that this will be difficult to achieve. So we will keep this number. And if you look at the IMF, which is on the lower side for this year, they are 6.1. They went to, they took a small unnecessary detour in my view from 6.1 to 5.9 in April and brought it back to 6.1 in July. Well, it is their problem. And uh, World Bank and the ADB are, have numbers closer to ours. And in general, therefore, uh, in the G20, uh, last year, barring Saudi Arabia, uh, among the other 19 economies, India had the highest growth rate. Now, obviously, comparisons to China are always uh, inevitable uh, uh, in several countries and also in several forums between India and China. You look at the GDP aggregate basis in dollar terms. China and India started out relatively close by the end of the millennium, last millennium, and then China surged, especially since 2005. And the gap is so huge that we think it must be due to the relative inefficiency of the Indian economy, which is also partly true. But if you look at it, I would divide China's economic growth phase is 1979 into four phases. 79 to 92, I would give them a gold medal for their economic reforms. 92 to 2004, I would give them a silver medal. 2005 onwards, especially until 2012, 13, probably it's a bronze and then below that, after that, it could be even something more inferior than that. Because the first phase of reforms actually had a lot of devolution to local governments, to uh, micro and small enterprises. And then it was public sector led, export led, and then it became debt led from 2005 onwards, more so since 2008, when they realized that the, wrongly so in my opinion, that the, uh, that the center of gravity of global growth has shifted eastward, uh, was the assumption after 2008 crisis, and they thought they could get away with a huge debt expansion. It was partly, partly a wrong calculation about the eastward shift, and partly a sense of desperation that their export markets are going to go in a state of funk US and European Union, and therefore they have to uh, crank up domestic demand through debt generation. So that is why if I deflate the dollar GDP of both the countries by the dollar debt of the non-financial sector in both the countries, India's line, which is the, the, perp, the light blue line, actually lies above the uh, China's line in the chart on the right. So in other words, per unit of debt, India has generated more dollar GDP than China has. It is one way to say that we still have some more room to expand our debt ratio and grow, but of course, China's story also provides us a cautionary tale on how far you can take it, okay? So in that sense, again, if you take out the China line, India's line in and of itself, I was telling some of people before we came into this hall, in 1993, India's dollar GDP was just under $300 billion in nominal terms. By 2023, it is at $3.4 trillion by March 23. So in 30 years, you have had roughly 12 times increase in nominal dollar GDP in India, even as the Indian rupee weakened from 30 to 80 in this period. So it is a tremendous achievement over multiple governments, coalition, single party, few parties, dollar depreciation, many crises. Yet 
dollar GDP has gone up by 12 times and without taking so much of debt on board. So I think these are all the fundamental strengths that we need to recognize. Now, of course, I'll come to the, this is the sort of the macro big picture story, uh, things that I didn't cover. Uh, I, may, I, can, I can address them during the Q&A. And if you look at the social aspects of the growth story, uh, that is what I'm sh I'll share some of the statistics. Of course, this is a quote from Kautilya. In the happiness of his subject lies the king's happiness. In their welfare, his welfare. He shall not consider as good only that which pleases him, but treat as beneficial to him whatever pleases his subjects. It's well, well articulated, easy to understand, but are we walking the talk here? Uh, so what are the strengths? A parliamentary republic, federal system of governance, fast-going economy, recent strides in public digital infrastructure, a population that now aspires to uh, be at the top of the food chain in terms of uh, standards of living and GDP. The opportunity is, of course, a most populous country. Youth bracket is quite big. Nominal per capita income is around 2 lakhs per annum. Literacy rate of 74%, which is rising. And what are the opportunities also? It's the demographic dividend, median age, 28.2. Working age population to total population is rising and is projected to continue to do so for 13 more years. And this youth bulge can be a big boost to economic growth. And it has been the case for many countries. Uh, and of course, the challenges, pluralistic, multilingual, multi-ethnic, one size fits all solutions, not feasible, simply because each state is equivalent, is larger than a European country. And more importantly, these challenges do not include some of the global challenges which are also present, especially uh, if you have to ask me, if you, are, if, you are to, if you were to ask me to name the most important challenge or threat to India's growth is the current global narrative around climate change, global warming and energy transition. I'll, I'll say more about that later. Uh, in terms of what we are doing, on the social sector. And here, since many of the responsibilities related to the social sector lie with the state governments, I am showing on the top center expenditure as a percentage of GDP on social services, including both the union and the state governments, okay? So one is as a percentage of GDP, the second bar is a percentage of total expenditure of the governments, and third, expenditure on social services in lakh crores or trillions of rupees, which is a line. 11.4 trillion rupees or 11.4 lakh crores to 21.3 lakh crores, roughly doubling. So you might say, so it's about 14% uh, compounded growth rate. This is in nominal terms, okay? Uh, and since inflation has been relatively on the lower side, about 7% or 6%, you can say in real terms, it's been growing at 7 to 8%, the overall general government expenditure. Specifically on expenditure on education health, which is also largely a state government responsibility, you have it on the bottom. This, the figures are in absolute rupee terms. Uh, and then uh, in terms of allocation to major social sector schemes. So in other words, there has been no depth of availability of resources uh, for some of the key aspects of the social sector achievements and definitely they are also important for achieving economic growth as well. So it is not that the outlays always translate into outcomes and many a time we confuse the absence of outlays as a de-emphasis on the priority or on the outcome which is not the case because one can always uh, for example, when 38 years ago, when Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi said only 15 paise of every rupee that we spend went to the ultimate beneficiary, and if somebody were to come and improve the efficiency and plug the leakages and ensured that 30 or 40 paise on the rupee went to the ultimate beneficiary and in the process reduced the overall allocation because now he or she is able to ensure more money goes to the ultimate beneficiary, the actual reduction and the expenditure is meaningless as a metric to compare the commitment to social sector. So major initiatives for better overall health is also part of the uh, 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 commitment to social sector. We have again given you multiple milestones, the various schemes introduced over the years from 2014 onwards until the most recent budget. So again, I don't want to spend time going over the details. You may be able to read them yourself. And effectively, the point here is that 
that is uh, that is contrary to some of the perceptions there is no lack of attention or there is no lack of prioritization of the key elements that constitute the founding pillars of economic growth so without a healthy population which we saw in the covid time or without education attainment we are not going to get the 6.5% or even higher growth rates that we are anticipating and if you look at the uh, national family health survey number 5 coverage and on the right side you see the change from national family health survey number 4 on child vaccination and uh, vitamin a supplements on the right side institutional births and delivery care wherever you see uh, lots of green on the right simply means that the improvements have been 100% or double so clearly in several of these aspects across the country uh, while the stock of issues that we face is still quite formidable and long the direction of the journey is correct and the incremental progress is significant enough to be noticed and yes we know that and many of you in this audience would have known this and i'm sorry for repeating it it is always true that for a country of this size which is after all still a lower middle income country whatever good things i might say you might say there are plenty of other things that need to be attended to or whatever plenty of things that you are worried about i can list plenty of good things that are happening and as john robinson put it whatever you say about india the opposite is equally true but therefore each one of us when it comes to a large country like this is actually like the five blind men trying to figure out the elephant okay it is never going to be possible for us to get the full picture that is why different perspectives have to always be in dialogue with each other to get the full picture and that is what i'm trying to do here and in terms of the other concerns that we all have today apart from health and education and allocations and so on one of the things we have is the employment uh, situation the absence of national level data on employment including rural india is both a problem and an opportunity it is a problem because we have only quarterly survey on urban employment and we do get the annual data on rural employment it is a problem so the data has to improve the data has to become available for both urban and rural india but it also presents an opportunity for people because since there is no data each one of us can find the anecdotal data that suits our bias and prejudices so that in that sense it's an opportunity therefore we are forced to rely on okay so i think the mic is working so we are forced to rely on uh many other indicators and piece them together for a sense of where employment stands so today we have the purchasing managers indices on manufacturing and services which are both showing an expansion which means employers are looking to expand their workforce the number above 50 shows it on the left side rather than employers trying to contract their workforce and then yes i know i saw the article in the hindu couple of days ago about the payroll additions and the epfo i am not convinced of that article we can talk about that later but the fact remains that whether it is temporary employment or permanent employment the net payroll additions under employee provident fund organization is a good indicator of lower wage level formal employment generation and that number for 22 23 is rising and well above the previous years and also if you look at the number of uh, persons demanding work under manrega is on is beginning to uh, come down compared to the previous years as the annual unemployment rate because of the fact that rural data is only available with a huge lag so we are still talking about 21 22 data on the right, on the left side but when it comes to urban unemployment data we do have all the way up to march 2023 and uh, mosb has done a good job on improving the timeliness of the urban unemployment rate data releases so for example for the quarter ending june we should be getting the data very soon uh, uh, so we are at uh, 6.8% this number did shoot up to 20% during the pandemic years again had a slight bump up in the second pandemic wave in april to june 2021 in fact uh, for example there was also a lot of controversy about indian gdp data but none of those controversies were aired when indian real gdp contracted by more than 20% or 25% in the first quarter of 2021 in other words when the gdp contraction exceeded most people's fears 
than Indian GDP data was reliable. When the Indian GDP data publishes numbers which do not accord with many people's pessimism, then the GDP data are suspect. So then obviously, we have to be very clear about where we stand before we question the data. So are we looking for confirmation? Or are we looking for data or analysis objectivity? That is something we need to keep in mind. OK. So we all know that stories sell better than statistics. And in fact, uh, there was this uh, very good uh, Tamil film back in the early 2000s uh, called uh, Anbe Shivam, Kam uh, starring Kamal Hazan. And there was this beautiful street play on the, uh, uh, on the rapacious capitalist versus the hapless uh, working class. And I think what is, but I don't go into the merits or demerits of that uh, situation in that movie or, or in general. The fact is those kinds of anecdotes and uh, powerful illustrations leave a large impact on people's psyche. So it's equally important to uh, sort of uh, supplement or look for specific stories. Uh, and that is what we have tried to do in the rest of these uh, couple of slides here. So for example, this is the story of a Paka house from the Prime Minister uh, Avas Yojana, and it is in Uttarakhand. And then this uh, girl in Leh gets the first tap water connection, and uh, it is located 325 kilometers away, Demchok, from Leh city at a height of 13,800 feet, where mercury can drop to minus 40. And then you have uh, in the tribal village of Bulum Gawan in Maharashtra, receiving electricity supply in 2018, nearly 70 years after, after independence. And then you have other stories of uh, tap water saturation achieved in Kanchipuram, 100%. And then this gentleman in Sirsa, 70-year-old Maniram, saving a, a lakh and a half on a, her, on a heart surgery under Ayushman Bharat. And then you have uh, other stories of the Bahanpur district in Madhya Pradesh having top tap water connections compared to 37% in 2019, 100% uh, of the households being uh, connected as well. In fact, uh, the box in this slide at the bottom, while you can read the rest of the uh, uh, stories on the other three main um, pictures here, the graphics here, I would like to highlight that uh, box item uh, at the bottom. Professor Sudipto Mandel, actually undertook a visit to the state of Jharkhand, which he had gone 50 years ago, specifically, so it is a backward state, and he went to four backward regions in that state. This article appeared in Mint in November 2022. It is still available on the internet. You can look for it. And what he saw across governments, across political dispensation over the last 50 years, what, he, what has changed since his previous visit was that he basically saw considerable progress in physical infrastructure, such as roads, houses, digital connectivity, adequate irrigation facilities, public distribution system, and education, and education facilities. Com combined with the intervention of the state and the general market development, extreme deprivation and hunger have been eliminated in these villages. These are his words. So I think it's, it's important for us, while we always have to learn from our failures, we also have to learn from our successes. And having pride in what we have achieved also provides the right impetus to carry on with the remaining tasks as well. And very recently, two weeks ago, the uh, multi-dimensional poverty index of the Niti Aayog was released. And uh, some of you may have seen it already. It looks at various indicators, not just the per capita income or consumption, household consumption, because ultimately what uh, a poor person, basically you are calling someone poor because they don't have the purchasing power to avail of many services. But if those services are made available to them in other ways, then effectively then the, even the lesser number of rupees they earn can be allowed for discretionary spending. So then you have to measure poverty on a multi-dimensional basis rather than narrowing narrowly at per capita income or per capita household consumption, etc. So on that basis, UNDP came up with the multi-dimensional poverty index and the second release of it uh, in India uh, was done recently and it covers the pandemic period, although not fully. Uh, so you can see the poverty headcount ratio dropping from 24.85% to 14.96% and the intensity of poverty dropping by three percentage points roughly and overall multidimensional poverty index is about 6.6% compared to 117 in the previous uh, such uh, survey assessment. 
And you see on the bottom, the difference between rural and urban. So rural is still about 19.28% on a headcount ratio basis. Urban is 5.27%. And how well each state has done, basically in almost all the states, there's been a significant decline in the multidimensional poverty headcount ratio. And you can see here that largest improvements happened in states like Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, UP, Orissa, and Rajasthan. In fact, if you look at the Ministry of Education's uh, uh, Educational Attainment Survey, which happens once in three years, what is interesting is that some of the states that were used to be called Bimaru states, Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh in particular, and Orissa or even Haryana, are doing better than the national average on science, math, and English and other languages compared to the southern states. So some of the sense of uh, you know, uh, superiority that some of the southern states used to enjoy about their educational attainment being higher than the national average, it doesn't come out very clearly in the uh, education survey between years three and 12, sorry, uh, st uh, standards three and standard 12, which is the Ministry of Education survey, which has got uh, several private sector participants as well in the committee. So I think some of the uh, laggard states are indeed catching up faster. And that is a good sign for the overall national average as well. It is not just in the multidimensional poverty index, but also in the education and proficiency in science and math and languages compared to national average. And the district-wise multidimensional poverty index score, how it looked in 2015-16 compared to 2019-21, you can see the transparent uh, uh, improvement as well. On the inequality front, I think there is uh, considerable attention and rightfully so. In general, the problem here is that we know that the last consumption expenditure survey data is available only for 2011-12. And the next household consumption expenditure survey has been initiated. And based on the, uh, therefore, these results should be out in 2024. The rural Gini coefficient was almost the same in 2004-05 and 2011-12. Urban Gini coefficient increased marginally from 35 to 37. But you can also, given the fact that we have to go back to 2011-12 data and do not have the most recent data, you can look at the inequality through other poverty-related uh, indicators. There exist other ways. One is the multidimensional poverty index, which you just saw now. And then the National Family Health Survey number five, huge strides made in quality of life, and also the UNDP multidimensional poverty index report which came out last year. And the Center for Commitment to Equity in Tulane University did do some work similar to what the Congressional Budget Office does in the United States. They basically look at the distribution of household income pre-transfers and taxes and post-transfers and taxes. And the Gini coefficient does come down quite significantly in the United States as well. In other words, fiscal policy does what it is supposed to do. Tax system is progressive and there are fiscal transfers. This is available with a two year lag. For example, today, if you go to the website of the Congressional Budget Office and look for distribution of household income, you can see the data for 2020, but not 21 or 22. Uh, I think probably even 2019 will be what's available right now. So anyway, so in the similarly for India, what they did was, they took the pre-fiscal income, subtract the direct taxes, add back direct transfers, indirect subsidies, in-kind transfers, and come up with the final income. And what they found was inequality estimates taking into account all this was actually 0.367. This is based on 2011-12 data. And it has come down to 0.311 after making these adjustments for transfers and taxes. This is consistent with what we saw for several other countries as well. In fact, this slide is a little bit difficult to read. I'll go back to uh, other countries' data. So, yeah. so if you look at the other countries' data, for the United States, for example, the Guinea coefficient drops from 50, 0.516 to 0.432 in 2019 after accounting for transfers and taxes. Same thing in Brazil, it drops from 0.67 to 0.55. Indonesia, it drops from 0.39 to 0.37. And for Turkey, it drops from 0.485 to 0.4. 
to 0.378. So similar results have been obtained for India based on 2011-12 data. And we have actually tasked the World Bank in the absence of the next household consumption expenditure survey, which should be available to us in 2024, we have also requested the World Bank to see whether they can update the CEQ results and how the inequality looks, taking into account the various fiscal transfers that I have shown you earlier uh, in the presentation. And this is the result that they showed for India. And overall, none of this presentation up to this point is to deny the amount of task that still lies ahead of us as I said. And there should be no uh, uh, sense of uh, smugness or complacency. We are still ranked 121 out of 163 in sustainable development goals. The country score is 60. The regional average, forget about the global average, the regional average is 66, 66.9. And where India stands in different areas is shown here. And some of the uh, images in the bottom may not be that easy to read, but it's available all on the uh, UN uh, SDG report website as well. So clearly the task ahead for India is still equally formidable, as impressive as the achievements have been. So overall SDG goals, 17 of them, 169 targets, almost impossible, many promises to keep by 2030. And in fact, among the many countries, beyond Lombok and Bibek Debra's work show that India is on track to achieve them around 2059, 30 years later. But other countries are even further behind in terms of meeting the SDG goals, which should be achieved by 2030. And in the Indian context, they have said, if you want to get the maximum bang for the buck, they have identified 12 specific areas which they want to focus on. Just as the uh, uh, startup investors look for higher multiples of exit, they identified these 12 areas where there is a higher multiple in terms of the reward to money spent ratio. Uh, so in terms of where we are, I think, I did mention to you that the challenges we face are not just with respect to SDG goals. We have multiple other issues with respect to the state government finances or the power sector reforms, or I spoke very briefly about the energy transition, which I can touch upon later. But the point remains that growth is not something that we pursue for its own sake, but evidence tells us that countries that achieve sustained income growth also achieve sustained development in other goals that we are interested in, such as health attainment, nutrition, institutional delivery, overall uh, uh, literacy rates, uh, gender participation, gender equality, all those parameters are indeed positively correlated with growth as well, because a sense of insecurity and a sense of lack of confidence disappear as growth and prosperity levels increase, and our mind is able to think broadly and horizons become wider. And that is why growth is not important for its own sake, but for what it delivers. On that parameter, I think we are better placed than many other countries today in the world, having put behind us some of the issues that dogged us in the second decade in terms of growth. But you can be rest assured that we are not resting on our laurels and that we are quite aware that on SDGs and several other important parameters, the road ahead is long, even if the journey has already crossed multiple milestones. Thank you very much.